This video is dedicated to Bill Watercott Sr. of the Carpenters Union, who died tragically in 1989. Bill felt strongly that Pittsburgh's building trades unions had a great story that needed to be told. His early support made this video possible. self-starting, independent thinking, highly skilled building trades union craftsmen, Bill Pittsburgh. They're not a jack of all trades and master of none. They are individuals who devote their life in mastering their particular craft. And that in turn gives Pittsburgh the quality construction that the average man and woman has learned to expect. Our forefathers, our fathers and our grandfathers, we worked, uh, they worked rather very hard and they picketed and they demonstrated to demand equal rights and, and a fair share of the wages for a fair day's work. And uh, it was a long, hard struggle. At the headwaters of the Ohio, gateway to a continent, Pittsburgh grew into a great industrial and commercial center. Its rapid growth made construction workers a vital component in the city's progress. From the beginning, Pittsburgh workers struggled for their rights. In 1814, shoemakers organized to control prices for their work. In the 1840s, women textile workers on the north side, fighting for the 10-hour day, erupted in militant strikes. In 1877, Pittsburgh railroad workers fought the Philadelphia militia, who had been sent in by the governor to break their strike. In the ensuing battle, Pittsburgh's rail yards and Pennsylvania Railroad Station were burned. The 1880s saw the growth of organizations representing and uniting workers. First, the Knights of Labor, then the American Federation of Labor, an organization of skilled trades. The AFL's founding convention was held in Pittsburgh in 1881. Pittsburgh's Carpenters District Council of Western Pennsylvania was founded in 1887. Local 27 of the Plumbers in 1890. The Iron Workers International Union and Iron Workers Local 3 in 1896. And Local 5 of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers was established in Pittsburgh in 1897. The call for the eight-hour day articulated the central demand of the union movement in the 19th century. Uh, today, when we assume the eight-hour standard, we, uh, we forget the long, arduous struggle it took to reduce the workday from 10 or even 12 hours. Uh, the achievement of the eight-hour day was one of the enduring victories of the American labor movement. We're summoning our voices from the ship and shop and mill. Pittsburgh's first Labor Day parade in 1887 was built around the call for the eight-hour day. The fight for a labor holiday was led by Peter J. McGuire, first general secretary of the Carpenters Union. First Labor Day parade, the carpenters were one of the 
probably the strongest craft in the building trades as far as being organized. We helped a great deal in the organization of many other unions because we were one of the original and had the more strength than many of the other organizations. Any worker can be very proud of the role that they played in that. Over the centuries, Pittsburgh evolved and grew, built stone by stone, beam by beam, by workers' hands. Plumbers Union was founded in 1889 in Pittsburgh. Our trade is a very good trade. In order to learn the plumbing trade from A to Z, you have to be quite a gifted person. Uh, you know the old expression, a plumber protects the health of the nation. We most certainly do. At the end of the 19th century, uh, the organization of skilled workers was progressing uh, in construction, uh, also in printing, brewing, uh, railroad, and mining industries. But in the large-scale mass production industry, such as steel, craft unionism was being brutally suppressed. On July 6th, in darkness and fog, two barges with 300 armed Pinkertons were towed up the river from Pittsburgh to Homestead. The workers were determined to turn them back. In the resulting 12-hour battle, seven steel workers and three Pinkertons were killed. It was one of the bloodiest confrontations America had seen in the struggle for workers' rights. When they locked out men at Homestead, then they were face to face with a grasping corporation and they knew it was their place to protect their homes and families and this was neatly done and the public will reward them for the victory they won and the, man the famous battle of homestead in 1892 and the subsequent rout of the amalgamated association of iron and steel workers marked the defeat of skilled crafts organization in heavy industry and cast a heavy shadow over Pittsburgh's labor relations for nearly a century. Despite the uh, suppression of craft organizations in large-scale industries such as steel and electrical, by 1907, the Iron City Trades Council claimed some 60 organizations several hundred locals, and over 100,000 members. One quarter of these locals were in the construction industry. That same year, the Master Builders Association began to group the union contractors which had signed contracts with various construction locals. The Master Builders Association uh, was started in 1907. Uh, it is primarily a union organization developed uh, to uh, work out uh, the relationship between unions and contractors. We represent contractors in western Pennsylvania that do about 80 percent of all the construction work uh, in this area. <laughs> One of the strongest motivators for union organization and construction was safety. The Wabash Bridge was being erected in uh, 1903. I think from the top cord to the, down to the river was 185 feet. And uh, something went wrong there and uh, the bridge buckled. Uh, 11 men got killed. I think three were injured. Back then, they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't have the safety laws that they have today. 
uh, you went out and you went to work. Uh, you felt it was too dangerous and you didn't want to do it. You picked up your lunch bucket and went home, that's all. But uh, today you have a lot more safety under your job through OSHA, state laws. Today you have a established apprenticeship programs and safety is part of the curriculum. Craft unions were uh, created to establish uh, certain standards of quality workmanship and safety on the job. Uh, they were maintained, however, by the feeling of solidarity that people who did the same type of work felt for their job and for one another. And important symbols of this solidarity became the union card and the union label. In the old days, we used to get into a meeting by uh, using a uh, pass uh, password. You had to knock on the door and know the password in order to get in uh, to the meeting. You're required to produce your union card uh, to those who uh, ask for it. So uh, with the plumber and the steam fitter and the bricklayer and the electrician and the carpenter, the exchange of cards assures that uh, the jobs uh, are done by union contractors. Everything I bought, I know I had contractors fight me, no one union say, I'll bet you have some non-union clothes on this, we'll check, show them a shirt. One guy even said, let me see your shorts, I showed them your shorts. <laughs> One guy said, how about your socks? I said, I don't know you need a label on, but we bought them in a union store. <laughs> Social events like ball teams and picnics reinforced workplace solidarity. However, the 1920s brought employer attacks on many unions. I started my apprentice program in uh, 1921. Shortly after, industry started to put in what they wanted to call the, uh, the American plan, which was uh, like your right to work uh, uh, today, it was to break the union. And uh, they, they worked uh, very hard to break the union. As a result, there was a strike that lasted for uh, some 22 months from uh, through 1921 to 22. All the contractors, with the exception of one major contractor, went non-union. Uh, the only one that stayed with the union was Sargent Electric Company. You know, Sargent was able to get the uh, Liberty uh, Tunnel lighting and power uh, project, uh, and money was short. And th those who worked uh, on the tunnel there didn't get an hourly rate, but whatever they could scrape together at the end of the week, they gave them, which took care of their lunch money and their car fare and what few pennies there was left. From the treasury of the local union, uh, would go out into the country and we'd buy uh, a field of potatoes or a, a flock of chickens or turkeys or hams, whatever we could buy, and then we'd bring it in and distribute it among uh, the needy ones that uh, were, were on strike. And uh, we helped uh, help keep a family together during a strike. My dad was the chief engineer of Liberty Tubes' uh, job, and uh, it was probably his proudest job. It was one of the first vehicular tunnels of that size in the country. It was fraught with problems. We certainly, they didn't have the equipment we had today. They still used steam shovels, and blasting techniques were not uh, nearly what they are today. Shoring techniques were not. Pittsburgh town is a smoky old town, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh town is a smoky old town, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh town is a smoky old town, solid iron from the keys poured down, Pittsburgh. Lord God, Pittsburgh. While unions were kept out of the uh, well, Pittsburgh steel mills until the 1930s, most of these mills, however, were erected and constructed by union craftsmen. We done all the erection of the buildings in the mill. We got into places where we moved the machinery, uh, the rod work and the foundations and things of that nature. Uh, that was long before the CIO was around. The early 1930s, brought depression and hard times for Pittsburgh's workers. However, with the election of Franklin D. Roosevelt, and particularly with the passage of the Wagner Act, which protected concerted activity by workers and established collective bargaining,
There was a great upsurge in union activity. However, the organization of industrial workers in the CIO uh, brought both opportunities and problems for craft unions, which were organized in the AFL. Prior to the uh, Wagner Act, the IBEW consisted purely of uh, journeyman electricians. Uh, then when the Wagner Act came in, we could see that it was necessary to protect uh, our, our work, that we had to get into the wire and cable and uh, switchboard manufacturing uh, divisions. Otherwise, if some other organization got in and they happened to have a strike and we couldn't get the materials, we would be out on the street. It was also in the 1930s that heavy highway work became organized around the building of the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The association started from the heavy side in 1934, and they started to negotiate contracts in 1937-38. They became formal and had a collective group called the Constructors Association of Western Pennsylvania, and they wrote and negotiated their first contract in approximately 1937 with four crafts the operating engineers, the laborers, the carpenters, and the teamsters. In ensuing years, they picked up two other trades, the cement mason and the pile driver. Well, I got a good union, the 974, and they like my neighbor who lives next door. Finest man you ever did see, an old country boy from Tennessee. He's a kind of fool of man, that's what he am. Construction unions were extremely important vehicles for immigrants to integrate themselves into the American economy. Uh, they offered immigrant workers uh, an opportunity for training and for good jobs. However, since the craft unions were organized almost as extended families, uh, it made it very difficult for new ethnic groups to break in and find work inside the craft union organizational structures. If you look at the history in the early 20s, the Italians had a hard time getting in the unions, and I think what probably brought them into the unions much more so was the fact that most of the Italians came over were tradesmen. My dad, for example, had worked in his dad's, he told me he was the oldest boy, and. He'd worked with his father's shop from the time he was four or five years old, mixing glue and sweeping up and things of that sort, and learned his trade that way. This traditional use of the extended family to recruit workers into the skilled crafts unions uh, caused a crisis when civil rights activists demanded jobs for black workers uh, in construction unions. Uh, this crisis came to a head at the famous Black Monday demonstrations around the construction of the United States Steel Building in downtown Pittsburgh in 1969. What are we coming to bringing them in? Everybody was afraid, and everybody was afraid they were going to lose their jobs. The color would take it, and nobody wanted them in there unless we was forced. And we were forced by the government. When they had the march downtown, we know we won the war. Okay, we was on top of the building, so there's nuts and bolts down. If they cut the people down on the street, they couldn't throw up on top of them buildings. We had the war won, as far as we're concerned. But when they tell you the federal government tells you you're gonna take so many people in, you're gonna take them in. We've done that. Now, since we took them in, we realize we're all happy. In fact, the colored people who belong to Local 3 and the iron workers always call me a godfather because I treat them the same as I did a white person, no different. They paid the same amount of dues, they came to the meetings, they participated in the meetings, all the functions, all the donated work, they did everything that we did, so why shouldn't we support them? Uh, the big thing is, they never quit. And I can't blame them because minorities never had a shot in this world. It's no different than the ethnic people first came over in this country. They had to fight to get what they learned. We shall
Rooted in guild and family traditions, today craft skills are handed on through union apprenticeship programs. In the late 1960s and early 70s, these programs were open to women and minorities. My uncle Tony was the first electrician, the first electrician in our family. He's uh, my father's brother. And he started by originally introducing minorities to the trade through Operation Dig. When he got in and I seen how he was enjoying his job and everything, and I always enjoyed wiring things just as a young guy, just wiring speaker wires or burglar alarms, whatever. I could do small things. I was interested in it too. I took the test and uh, then ended up getting the job. The construction industry has to realize that in the next 33 years, everything that we see has to be built once over again. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to have qualified crafts persons to perform that work. There is not enough m male uh, uh, craft persons to perform the work today. We need to get involved in developing female craft persons. We need to get into minorities being brought aboard and educated and trained to be able to perform that work. I have two older brothers. My oldest brother is a union laborer, and my brother up under him is a steam fitter. And in 1979, they informed me that the unions were starting to take in women. And I went downtown, took a test. They submitted it to different unions. The cement masons gave me an interview. They hired me, and now, 12 years later, my son is a cement mason apprentice. He started last month, and we're the first mother and son team in the union. Many of uh, Pittsburgh's craft unions are more than 100 years old. During that time, they've shown an amazing ability to adapt to changing situations. Probably nowhere is that more true than in labor relations where in recent years in particular, they've been able to strike a balance between an activist and even militant attitude toward non-union contractors with a much more cooperative uh, and participative relationship with the, their own union contractors. When I started with the Master Builders Association in the early 60s, uh, the uh, environment was a hostile environment between contractor and unions. Uh, there were many jurisdictional disputes and uh, they were on opposite sides of the spectrum. Uh, distrust uh, prevailed and uh, there really wasn't any type of a uh, harmonious relationship in this industry uh, and that uh, made for a very hard uh, uh, labor relations situation in western Pennsylvania. And I was the type of guy that the tougher they came, the better I liked it. And uh, I went out, I started organizing, we took a lot of contractors in, and I couldn't get them to go union, but in the meantime, I told my four brothers, all six foot five, six foot six, but I was in good shape, and I said, I'll tell what we'll do, we'll close the door, and I'll fight each one of these right after the other. If I win, you go union. If I lose, you can stay non-union. And they thought it over and they laughed about it, and, but they didn't want to fight, and I really didn't care for a fight myself, but that was the only thing I could actually tell them. The worst point in the heavy highway industry was in 1969 and 70 when we went through a 17-month strike. After the strike, we, you could watch and see the beginning of a tremendous influx of non-union contractors. Some of the people who had been union contractors when the strike started were no longer union contractors. Plus, new people were coming into the area. Uh, when these steel mills were going strong, they all had good training programs, and they were training carpenters and electricians and bricklayers and uh, so forth. Uh, when, uh, when the collapse of the steel mills came about, naturally all these people were out of work and they were out of checks, 
And as a result of all this, the ABC non-union contractors took advantage of a economically depressed area such as ours and grabbed these people and put them to work for four and five and six dollars an hour. Anger against the growing tendency to use non-union labor led to an extraordinary outpouring in November 1986 when the streets of Pittsburgh overflowed with 45,000 construction workers protesting the use of non-union labor in the renovation of the Pennsylvania Railroad Station. I believe that when we roll around and get back up on top, what's going to keep us alive is our great numbers of skilled workers and our contractors' expertise, as you can see or hear in this job. Those two factors together, our great skill and their expertise, makes us very competitive to the non-union contractor. Well, before I got in the union, I worked for a non-union man. We did nice work. We put paint on things. We used more spackle than I've ever used since. Cosmetically, it looked good, but it was, it was shoddy work. I had a chance to join the union, Carpenters Union. And I got in, I made it, and I learned how to do things right. I learned plumb, I learned level, I learned square, and I learned how to get all those things. In some cases, you'll hire non-union contractors, and you'll get a, a decent job. But by and large, you get what you pay for. Uh, the skill and the ability of some of the individuals that work for these companies is terrible. And the workmanship that is put in the jobs, the customer winds up with the problem of maintaining these buildings once they're wired and uh, the other roofs on and the roof leaks and the wiring shorts out and so forth and so on. I think the, the big advantage of having a, a union job is the quality of the construction work. All of these unions have apprenticeship programs, and all of the workers are very skilled out here. I think it goes back to the olden days, and with the old uh, journeyman and apprentice type work, where they took a lot of pride in their construction. And they, I think when they're done with the job, they stand back and look at it and say, wow, yeah, I did that. Well, when they talk about topping off a building, they refer to the last piece of iron that is put in place on that building. Usually they'll have a little ceremony with this, and the members will sign their name to the last beam that's going up, or last piece of iron. They hang an American flag on it. When people in the construction industry are asked to define the turning point, in terms of reversing the decline of union jobs in construction, they point to the job recovery program of the early 1980s. In particular, they credit Joe Beasley, the operating engineers, with beginning the process of looking at the economics of the business and looking at the problems faced by union contractors. They began to recognize that technological change had meant that certain jobs were becoming obsolete. Uh, I had a choice that I had to make, uh, having uh, just been elected uh, first term as a, uh, the business manager of uh, the Operating Engineers Local 66. Uh, I could either attempt to tell the membership that everything was going to be all right and mislead them, or else I could be honest with myself and with them and try to convey to them what needed to be done, the changes that needed to be brought about in, in reference to change things so that we could have a working relationship with the union contractor and, and still continue to have contractors and employ our people. We found ourselves confronted as union contractors with a great dilemma. We were no longer doing 50% of the work in the marketplace. We could not compete. And we decided that the adversarial relationship that we had established through the years just would not work. We live in an increasingly global society. Management and labor both have come to recognize and have recognized in this city the need to work together, to help each other, to cooperate. Because we really are both after the same thing. We want our people to be well paid, have proper health and pension cares, and on the same token, we want to get a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. I see the time not that far down the road when people will think 
of labor as an opportunity, as a source where ideas can come to help. Because the most important asset we have on any construction site is our human resource. Material is always available, equipment can be had, but if you don't have a good supply of human resources, this business just stagnates. The changing face of labor relations and construction is best symbolized by the labor agreement at the new midfield terminal of Pittsburgh's International Airport. This massive construction job will last four years, move 19 million cubic yards of earth, employ nearly 3,000 construction workers, and involve 26 contractors and 27 unions. Labor's committed um, for providing steady uh, supply of workers out here, regardless of what happens, and management's committed to sitting down and uh, reviewing grievances, jurisdictional disputes, any type of unrest that might unsettle the labor picture out here. The unions pledged cooperation and no work stoppages during the airport project in return for a recognition by the county of 10 points defining a responsible bidder. Among the so-called Ten Commandments, a responsible bidder would have an affirmative action program, medical coverage, a pension plan, and a grievance procedure. I mean, feel in this day and age, everybody is entitled to decent medical care, and everybody should have some kind of a pension plan. That is one of the ten points. We feel that uh, there should be some kind of a grievance procedure established when, a, an, when an employee is, is abused or misused, and that is in there, that, there's, that that employee has another choice other than to open his mouth and get fired or keep his mouth sh shut, work in unsafe conditions, take the abuse. We feel that a man in this day and age, or a man or woman in this day and age, shouldn't have to live like that. The key reason that union contractors can compete and still pay excellent wages and benefits is the high level of skill and efficiency of the union craftsmen. The union segment are the only one that really spend money on training. If you take last year, we probably spent $500 million against maybe $50 million by the unorganized people. Construction work is a up and down business, it's seasonal. You need a large workforce for a short period of time. It gives you the advantage of being able to pick up the phone and get them. When you have a qualified journeyman on a project, he could pretty much accomplish the work that needs to be done without supervision because he has been trained and he is qualified to perform that work and he goes about and does his work without any uh, supervision on a day-to-day -day basis. For everything to be tied in here together and the contractors to come out here and make money, they have to on a project this size, have everybody involved in bottom line. And the bottom line is here getting the job done with no problems, on time and in budget. Our organization sells one product, and that is the skill of our people and the ability to do a job. And we think we have the best people in the world to do this type of work. For the worker, the union brings a high level of benefits as well as a concern for the safety on the job that protects the public as well as the worker. Well, the construction worker is better all the way around belonging to the union. Our retired construction workers enjoy a better health than uh, their non-union counterpart. They have hospitalization coverage paid for uh, as retired uh, unionized construction workers. Eight-hour workday, the unemployment compensation, workman's compensation, social security, vacation pay, all the various benefits that we enjoy today were one long, hard-fought gains that we got by organized labor. And naturally, our young people were actively engaged working as union building tradesmen. They're enjoying at least 40 percent more in their take-home pay, which enables them to live better. We have a very strict safety program. When a contractor comes in here at the start of a job, one of the requirements that we ask of him is uh, the safety program. We require him to have a safety meeting 
with all of the employees on the job at least once a week. Management has a textbook knowledge of what the hazards are, and they may walk out into the field and see a few here and there, but it's the guy that does the work day in and day out that actually knows what the hazards are. The unions insist uh, that the, the contractor, if it's not a safe uh, work area and so forth, our people have the, uh, the right to refuse uh, to work them under those conditions. And uh, the contractor is obligated to put them in another work area until the appropriate safety officials can be called to check this area out. The building trades unions have a long tradition of public service. They know how to chip in and help in time of need. Uh, in the late 70s, uh, the Johnstown flood in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where thousands and thousands of homeowners were without electricity because of the flood waters that had uh, uh, went into their homes. And we worked together with the fire companies up there in cleaning up the panels, the wiring that was all through the homes. Uh, we had approximately 500 electricians on one day, uh, 400 on the second day. You know, so often we hear about unions negotiating for wages and better benefits and so on. And damn it, the public has to realize the social aspect of the labor movement. This monument was built 100% union. We're quite proud of that. But it was done with their sweat. There were days on this site here when we had as many as 100 uh, volunteers. The electricians, the iron workers putting the shell up, the cement finishers, the, even the pipe insulators who really had no jurisdiction brought their whole apprentice class. The carpenters every weekend would send their whole apprentice class. In fact is we had the luxury of more workers than we had worked for. I did some of the uh, flood lighting to light the uh, walls up around the memorial and ran some of the conduit in the uh, underground to the uh, service pad. I feel that I had the opportunity to become an electrician and I like giving part of that back. You know, the whole Vietnam experience was so much a blue collar thing and it was from the working families of this country. I think it's quite fitting that the working people of Western Pennsylvania built and erected this monument. Churches would call us and tell us they don't have the money, don't have the funds, would we help them donate labor? We've done that for the churches. So everything, and uh, Camp Friday for the handicapped children, I put a lot of years in there, I put about three years in there, and I had as many as 2,000 people up in one day working up in the place. The history of more than a century of Pittsburgh's building trades unions is one of struggle, achievement, and change. This is a history of hard-working people and of the organizations that represent them. This is the story of Building Pittsburgh. You never get through learning this trade. When you talk about an apprenticeship, that gives you the basic rudiments. When you talk about the trade itself, you're learning every day of your life. A union means has brought my family up, gave my family a very good living, and I made a decent wage. I didn't have to hide my face going to work. I wasn't union. I, I was not non-union. I didn't have to sneak around the car or anything else. I walked proudly to my job, and I did my job, and I got well compensated for it, and my family grew it up, and I think I'm proud of that. As a cement finisher, I'm a woman in a man's trade. I'm also a black woman in an industry where minorities have had to struggle. But I love my union, and I love my work. And I believe that young people, including blacks and women, have a great future in the union building trades. My father was a union labor leader for close to 18 years. And many, many times in his speeches and whenever he was addressing any group of people, he would state that it was not just a job for him, but it was a way of life. And right now it is up to the younger generation, I feel, with the guidance of the older generation and what they have learned through the years to uphold the quality of our organization and to uphold the safety and the quality and the fairness that each individual in their communities deserve.